One of the biggest barriers to our spiritual growth as disciples is that, of course, we still sin, no matter how mature we are. And this is why so much of the Christian life is preaching the gospel to ourselves from the moment of conversion to the day that we die. In this video, we're going to discuss the topic of justification and sanctification with the help of chapter 5 of Deeper by Dane Ortland. This chapter is called Acquittal. If you've been around the church for a while, you've probably heard the phrase preaching the gospel to yourself. But what does that actually mean? Ortland teaches us that one way to do this is to focus on what he calls the sharpest edge of the gospel, the doctrine where the sheer gratuity of the grace of the gospel stands forth most clearly, justification. Now, the core idea here is that we do not move past the gospel in our discipleship. Meditating on how God saved us is the pathway of the Christian life. It's the road that we walk on. To think of it another way, in our Pilgrim's Progress adventure, the gospel is not just the starting line, but it is the whole road that we take to the finish line. Now, central to that process is the interplay and relationship between two massive theological ideas, justification and sanctification. Justification is God's righteous declaration that, based on Christ's perfect obedience, the satisfaction of condemnation for sin, we are made righteous in his sight. Sanctification is God's progressive work of making his people holy as he is holy, and he invites us to participate in that process. And your spiritual growth is connected to those truths. This is how Ortland puts it at the bottom of page 85. The process of sanctification is, in large part, fed by constant returning ever more deeply to the event of justification. Now let's unpack this statement and see how it can help us in our spiritual journey. The first thing that we need to grasp is that justification is outside in. Our reconciliation to God, our status in God's eyes, our innocence and righteousness before God, our inheritance of all of God's promises, these things come from someone else who gives them to us. Someone has made a verdict about you. And the amazing news of the gospel is that in Jesus Christ, the verdict is good. Yet as I discussed in the last video, it is incredibly difficult for us, even as Christians, to accept that God really loves us and declares us to be forgiven, accepted, justified. There are many different reasons for this. Some of us instinctively define ourselves by our own performance. How am I doing? Well, just look at the things around me. Others of us define ourselves by everything that everyone says about me. So if a friend rejects me, or a family member criticizes me, or even if a stranger reacts negatively to me, I lose all my sense of self. But in order to embrace justification, we need to avoid both of those errors. Justification is neither finding our identity in what I say about myself, nor in what everyone says about me, but rather in what the Creator and the Savior says about me. Sanctification is the opposite. It is inside out. How we change as people is ultimately what God is doing internally in our hearts, and we get to participate in that process. So how do you know if you are growing as a Christian? Now, the fruit of your life, the external things, the works, can be a test, but that fruit comes from the heart. It's not, I know I'm growing because I'm very consistent in reading the Bible. It's, I know I'm growing because my love for God's word is increasing. It's not, I know I'm maturing as a disciple because I serve in these areas of the church. It's, I know I'm maturing as a disciple because I want to serve more and more. Too often, the external things, the works, the things we do or say, become the basis for our spiritual growth. But while these things are indicators, they are not growth itself. They are the appearance of godliness, but godliness itself comes from heart-level change. Now, here's the last piece of the puzzle, and it's crucial. Sanctification is fed 
by the daily application of our justification. Every single day, remember what God has done for you, what he has said about you, what he has given to you, and you will begin to notice changes in your soul. Ortland says this on page 92, Our fallen hearts are spring-loaded to assess our justified state on the basis of how our sanctification is going. But we grow in Christ by placing our sanctification in the light of our justification. In other words, you grow by remembering what you already know. I remember once somebody telling me about their relationship with their father. Their father was an old school traditional type who did a lot for the family he provided, but he never told his children in words that he loved them. Now this son went off to college and he would visit occasionally, maybe helping out around the house if he felt like it. And then one day, out of the blue, the father called his son, and he said, Son, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I love you. And of course, the son burst into tears, and he said, I love you too, Dad. And all of a sudden, the son began to spend more and more time at home. He started to want to help out around the house, because he got to spend more time with his dad. Now before, the son knew that his father loved him, but now in his heart, he knew it deeply. And it changed the way that he lived. And so it is with our spiritual growth. We grow spiritually in the context of a secure relationship with God. I love how Ortland says it. Sensing our inadequacy, we set up our career, our relationships, our studies, our public speaking, our athletic abilities as functional gods to which we are looking for justification to know that we're okay. But what if we went into the interview, the conversation, the classroom, the game, already okay, already justified, not just theologically, but emotionally, not just in our mind, but in our gut? We would be world shakers. Let me give you two practical examples of how we are sanctified by applying our justification. First, imagine that you receive some negative criticism. It could be from your spouse or your boss or a friend, but you've just been told something unpleasant about yourself. You're too judgmental. You did this wrong. How do you respond to that feedback? Now, you could brush it off. I don't need this. Haters will be haters. But then you're not growing in humility and self-awareness. You could hyper-focus on the criticism and spiral into shame and self-loathing, but then you lose all sense of identity because of someone's disapproval. But what if you remembered that God has declared you to be both a sinner and a saint? You are a sinner saved by grace. What if you remembered that, yes, you were far from God, you were broken, you were dead, but then he brought you near and gave you his righteousness? Then you would have the humility to accept and learn from rebuke, I know I'm not perfect, but you would also have the confidence to know that your identity does not depend on others' approval, but only on the approval of God. To give you another scenario, imagine that you're praying and you realize it's been a long time since I've prayed. I've been there myself. You're feeling guilty, like before you can actually pray, you need to apologize profusely and feel enough remorse so that God will actually listen to your prayers. But what if you were to bring to mind Hebrews 4.16, which says that because of Jesus' atonement for our sins, we can draw near to the throne of grace in our time of need, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us. Because of what Jesus has done for me, I can walk up to the Father's throne and I can say, I'm sorry it's been a while, but thank you for letting me come here whenever I need it. Here's what I want to talk about with you. If you want to learn more about how to preach the gospel to yourself, there's a fantastic book by Jeff Vanderstelt called Gospel Fluency, Speaking the Truths of Jesus into the Everyday Stuff of Life. It goes more into the practical ways that we can apply our justification to our sanctification. But there's one spiritual discipline that I want to highlight in this video that can help you in this area as well, and that's the discipline of Sabbath. The Sabbath is a huge biblical theme that runs through the entire Bible, 
And if you're interested, I've put some resources below so you can learn more about it. But what is the connection between justification, sanctification, and the Sabbath? It's this. We are saved through the work of Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins and to give us his righteousness. And we receive that salvation by trusting, resting in him. And in the same way, the Sabbath is a habit of life where we intentionally rest on one day of the week in order to rest in God's control over everything. The Sabbath teaches us that we have limits, that we are addicted to work and hurry and busyness, and that we can trust God for all that we are not doing. Adele Alberg Calhoun puts it this way, Sabbath is a day God gives us to remember who and what work is for, as well as what matters most. God's Sabbath reality calls us to trust that the Creator can manage all that concerns us in this world as we settle into His rest. So practicing the Sabbath in your life is a way of practicing resting in the Gospel. And it can look many different ways. Here are some suggestions for getting started. First, choose a time to stop. The word Sabbath means to cease, and so on the Sabbath, we intentionally do less and pause our busyness. Now, not all of us can put down our work. I'm looking at you, moms of young kids, and that's okay. Choose a day when you can say, this day will look different than the rest of the week. For example, no laundry today, no errands. If cooking is a chore for you, choose meals that are quick to make or make them ahead of time. Because of our digital world, consider resting your devices. Maybe you put them away entirely, or maybe you put them on Do Not Disturb and you only use them to play music or something like that. Think about what normally fills your day, what occupies your heart, and choose one day a week when you have the freedom to put it down. Second, fill the time with rest. The Sabbath is not just about stopping, it's about stopping some things in order to make space for other things. Consider activities that are restful for you and choose a variety, uh, some things that you can do alone, others that you do with people, things that require a lot of time, things that you can do in 60 seconds. For example, go on a walk, have a picnic, take a nap, call a friend, make a good cup of tea. Find a new game to play with your kids. Have a family movie night. Have a spontaneous dance party for 60 seconds. In all these things, you're doing them not only for self-care, you're also doing them, and primarily doing them, for worship. To rest in God, and not in your accomplishments, not in your achievements, not in your work. And that is why the Sabbath is one practical way for us to preach the gospel to ourselves. As we come to the end of this video, take a moment and answer this question. What are the areas in my life where I most need the gospel right now? Where are you striving or struggling and you need to apply the good news so that you remember all that God has said about you and done for you? As usual, I'm going to pray for you to end this video. Will you pray with me? Father, teach us what we already know. May the truth of your good news, of your gospel, sink down deeper into our souls every day so that we would look more and more like Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.